Hey, this is Professor Game, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting our students to learn what we teach. And I am Rob Alvarez. I'm the founder of Professor Game and professor of gamification and games-based solutions at IE Business School, EFMD, EBS University, and many other places around the world. And if this content is for you, then please go ahead and subscribe to our email list for free at professorgame.com slash subscribe. Hey, Engagers, and welcome back to another episode of the Professor Game Podcast. And we have a very special guest today. The guest is Matt. But Matt, before we take off, we need to know, are you prepared to engage? I'm totally down. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's go. Because we have Matt Nuccio. Is that, is that a, a decent way to pronounce it, Matt? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I've been called far worse. Nuccio work. <laughs> so Matt Nuccio is the president of Design Edge Inc., a toy and game development company and licensing agency whose clients include Mattel, Hasbro, Spin Master, and Fisher Price, to name only a few. For four years, he co-chaired the Toy Association on their associate panel, representing all designers and inventors within the toy industry. He currently sits on the board of directors of the United Inventors Association of America, which is a nonprofit working to educate and advocate for all types of inventors. He also sits on the People of Play Advisory Board and Toy Association's Creative Factor Advisory Board, helping startup inventors to navigate successfully within the toy industry. He writes a column in the Toy Family Entertainment Magazine focusing on the industry and has lectured at Cheetag, New York Toy Fair, Astra, Hong Kong Toy Fair, and various inventor clubs around the world, including the 2021 Emerging Innovation Summit in Melbourne, Australia. Design Edge's products have been nominated for and have also won many industry awards, such as the Toy of the Year, Taggy, Toy and Games Innovators, Games 100, Origin, and Family Fun, among others. And in 2019, he was honored by the National Security Agency as an American innovator and has been listed for the past four years in a row by Mojo Nation as one of the top 100 most influential people in the toy industry today. So Matt, amazing background, so many things that you've done. I don't know if there's anything you want to mention before before we move on. Hey, I'm, I'm, in, I'm listening. I'm like, oh, I need to bring this guy around with me to introduce me to people. <laughs> Sounds amazing. So Matt... You know, so many things are happening nowadays, but, you know, what if we were to sort of be in, in your shoes for a while, what would, I don't know, a day, a week, a month, you know, what does a regular time with Matt actually look like? What are you doing these days? Drinking a hell of a lot of coffee. That's what I'm doing these days. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I mean uh, typical days, you know, show up at the studio, we just start cracking and working on things, development in all different phases of development, whether it's just brainstorming up rough ideas or game concepts or toy concepts and, you know, drawing them out with a Sharpie on some pads and then taking it straight through to prototyping and engineering and costing and communicating with our clients and going back and forth and a lot of, you know, spitballing of ideas. It's, it's just, uh, you know, keep the machine going. Just, you know, toys is a fashion business. There's no time to sit back and, and relax. You know, we, we're just, you know, full throttle. <laughs> a lot of things going on and it seems I love the fact that you seem to be so involved in every single part of the product right, or the projects you know some some people say well when you get to a certain level you cannot be involved but it seems that in your case it's quite the opposite is that right yeah and and that that just happened it just fell fell together that way you know there wasn't there was no plan for that we just as we grew our clients needed additional services we would learn how to do them <laughs> and then and just add it on but you know <laughs> design edge is a you know it's a 36 year old company I, I grew up in the, in the business my parents started it in the garage when i was a kid but my dad had started the toy industry in the late 1960s and back in the day when everything was done domestically right right in the u.s and the creative director and head of marketing for a, a large toy company at the time called hg toys and he had to oversee everything including the production lines so I got the benefit of all that knowledge coming up because my dad was one of the few designers that understood the entire process because in his day, he was all done under one roof. And today it's very rare. You know, everything's so segmented. Like, you know, people are like, I just do this. You know, I just hit button A. You have to go to a guy over there if you need button C pressed. But we understand the full range. And that's become a major benefit to Design Edge, too, which is why, you know, the behemoth companies of the industry rely on us as well as, you know, startups who want to break in. We streamline it. it. It's it's A to Z. 
Sounds amazing. And thank you for all, all, all of that. I mean, we, we love to hear the history of how it actually came to be, at least for you, how you grew up with all these things. And, you know, not, not everybody gets that amazing opportunity that you got, but there's opportunities going all around in the industry, I would say, and specifically in toys and games, in gamification, all these things that we have been discussing for a while. So let's actually dive into a, a, a big question for us, which is, just about failure, you know, first attempts at learning or fails, fail moments. Do you have a, a time when designing or creating a toy or a game that you would say, well, this, this is a big lesson that we got. And, you know, ever since we've never looked back and, you know, it's been an amazing lesson and, and it has helped us in the way forward. And so sort of call your favorite failures, maybe perhaps. Oh, I find most failures hysterical. <laughs> like that's <laughs> it's just part of the fun. It's part of the process. You can't do what we do and not expect to fail. It's we're, we're failing 99% of the time. It's just, that's R and D for you. I mean, if you can't take failure, you can't do what we do. You have to be able to like laugh it off or you get up and brush your pants off, but you have to take the knowledge that you have also know how to pivot. It's really not about recognizing failure. It's about knowing when to pivot. Huh? That makes sense. Is there, is there any, you know, perhaps is there a, a particular time that you remember when when thinking of of the of word like like failing and and, and learning a, a a big lesson? I mean, they, it happens all the time, you know. And then it depends on your definition of a failure, right? Because to some, just getting their game to market is success, and to others, selling fifty thousand units of your game is a failure. Yeah, we have to take in all considerations, you know. And 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 there's so many different aspects to what makes a toy or a game successful. And some of it's beyond your control. You know, there's been times when we've worked on some really amazing stuff, but it was under the wrong movie license and the movie bombed, right? So it was a tank. And then other times, you know, we, there's been stuff that we've worked on, which we thought was, was amazing and, and just retail just wasn't ready for it or, or maybe really wasn't amazing. You know, you just take it as it rolls. Then there's sometimes we've launched something and it does all right. Everyone's like, okay, it was a good base hit. And then a year later, someone does this basically the same thing and it's a massive success. So then we're like, all right, what do we do wrong? And we have to analyze it. And it's, there's so many factors to it. You know, sometimes it is bad design and bad engineering. Sometimes it's just bad marketing. Sometimes it's just lack of marketing. Sometimes the competitor just has an amazing marketing advantage. Like a great example of that is we did a game called uh, Hashtag It with endless games it did all right you know, we were kind of happy with it it was a good solid base hit and then pretty much about a year and a half two years later came out what do you mean which is pretty much the same exact game but it was done by you know the social influencer for fuck jerry and he had eyes that we just didn't have we couldn't compete so that became the standard and then and, and hashtag it faded away huh after seeing things like that happen is there I mean, I, I, of course, you, you mentioned it at the start. There's lessons that you take from that. Is there, is there anything that comes to mind from one of these stories that you just gave us? Well, I'll give you another example. So we had an item, I guess it's about 10 years ago, called Pet Cakes. And it was with a, a company that had been around for 50 years, but they were primarily promotional plush stuffed animals and stuff for anything from carnivals to just like lower price point stuff, rag dolls. Did big business at Toys R Us, and I had come up with a line for them, and we had named it Pup Cakes. So they're basically little dogs that sat in cupcake wrappers, and they had little toppings on their head, and it was getting great reception. Everyone was super excited about it. There was bigger companies trying to buy the company. The guy wouldn't sell the company, which is that's his prerogative. I you know I can't tell someone to sell their company, but. I was in meetings where they offered them $10 million cash on the spot to take over the line, and the guy turned it down. And you know, his theory being, if they're going to pay us $10 million cash, they obviously see a big opportunity here, and we should just do it ourselves. So I rolled with the punches. And next thing you know, he's deciding, and his team, the, the toy company, I should say, that Pup Cakes is too limiting. We should name it Pet Cakes. And I was against that. And I felt it took the pun away from Cupcake and didn't make any logical sense. And ultimately, when they did that and they brought it into Walmart and it sort of dissipated, 
and it was all different types of animals assorted. It lost its cuteness and it lost its instant message and it lost its mm. pun. Mm. And that's what killed the product. Wow. <laughs> so some, such a small, what some people might say is such a small change, right? Just completely obliterated what they had been doing and then it more, an over $10 million opportunity. And their logic to them sounded like, we're going to miss an opportunity where we could be doing cats and squirrels and woodland creatures and pandas and bears. And I was like, pet cakes to me sounded like a nice way of saying dog shit, right? Like, oh, look, it's a pet cake, you know, but a pup cake sounds like cupcake. And I thought, you know, I still think that's a, the stronger of the two. And one of the companies that almost took, wanted to take it over at one point, Spin, uh, Spin Master, I once had a meeting with the head of their, uh, their inventor relations and he pretty much said the same thing to me. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly how I feel. And then we had a couple of beers, but it's like, yeah, but it was a lost opportunity. And at one point I thought that was going to be my big home run. So those, those things are, uh, but they come and go. That's part of this business. It's the adrenaline of like, oh, this is going to be huge. And, and sometimes they're huge on a social level and, and not a financial level. Sometimes they make a lot of money and no one's ever heard of it. it it's, there's so many ways to win in this business. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. And you know, you're, you're saying like, it's one of the things that it always comes to my mind when, I, when we're doing workshops. The typical thing that always comes to, you know, to professors and, and business people alike is, you know, our solution has to be for almost everyone, right? And I always like, I'm always adamant on saying, no, look, you have to look for what is your niche, what is your, your group of people will be really excited and really into whatever it is that you're creating. You want- <laughs> and, and I feel it's like the, the pet cake, like, oh, you're, we're losing out on the monkey cakes yeah. and on the you know, the ant cakes or whatever it is else that you're doing, right? Well, my father said to me, <laughs> and I'll never forget this, and I, I've quoted him before on other shows because I, I do think this is sort of brilliant. Uh, I don't think he coined it, but it was, it was put to good use. He, goes, he said, Matt, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, and and that happens a lot. That happens a lot. It happens. I was saying that I do it in workshops. I I'm just I just came from a class with my group of students at a business school, and they're they had it's a design masters that they're doing, and and I teach them something on on gamification and, and small things in game design as well. And and one of the things is you know their teams are eight people strong, right? Mm-hmm. And they have similar backgrounds, so it's it's kind of a committee in many ways. So it, it makes it a little bit harder for them, and that's that's part of the challenge. But it, it's it's that managing to be able to focus on what is the really important thing. And we keep on fleshing out things and it's like, yeah, that sounds good. But, you know, how can you narrow it down and narrow it down and narrow it down to make sure you're actually targeting the right thing, right? You're making sure that it is that thing that you're actually trying to get. And I don't know, that's one of the things that hit me when I heard your story. So I, I wanted to make sure I got it out yeah, there. Uh, the, the, and you were 100% correct. And sometimes mm-hmm. we'll run two or three teams in parallel and try to separate them to see what the results are huh well you know that that's just stuff that that can happen for sure and matt you know let's actually go for for a, a 180 degree spin on this actually of a story of one of those creations that you and your company have had that actually went super well one of those sort of proud moments something you want to share and perhaps let us in on, on some of the what you would call one or two of the success factors that you would see from that well, it depends again on what you define as a success because everything here keeps the doors open and the insurance <laughs> is paid and, you know, people's kids fed. You know, there, there's items that I'm super proud of that, you know, just do marginally well every year, but they've been doing well year over year, over year for a decade. And then there's items that we do that, you know, shot through the roof for one year and then we're nowhere to be found the year after. In case in point, just story time theater, which we did, which was that one that was nominated for Tory of the Year. It's not even on the market anymore. And then the flip side of that is a game we do with Goliath Pressman Toys called Color Smash, which is just a very simple game that's now been on the market for 12 years and still going well. I'm not buying, you know, Ferraris with the royalties checks, but it's, 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 <laughs> I'm not complaining at the same time. You know, but while something like Storytime Theater, you know, big royalty checks on items like that, you know, $60 item selling in hundreds of thousands of units, it's, they're very different. But, you know, it's, it's your measure of success. You know, you can't, it's a good comparison to be like the movie business. Like, you know, I, I'm not sure if I want to be the summer blockbuster guy all the time. Occasionally, I want to make a heartfelt film for, for a select few. Love that. Love that for sure. And it, it, it sort of piggybacks to what we were discussing before of, you know, doing it for the people you want to do it. And, and if, you know, doing that for them, it's successful with 
that group of people. It's actually a complete success. You you got what you were going for, for sure. And it, I would even argue that it's, I don't want to say easier, but it's, it's a better opportunity that you have and you're better set for it if you actually do, as, as you're saying, you're targeting a specific audience when you are creating or designing for everybody. You know, it's, it's really hard because everybody doesn't have, you know, habits. Everybody doesn't have similar likes. Everybody doesn't have a lot of things. So it's really hard to, to sort of grasp that with your hand. I always like to use the example of Facebook and I hope nobody is offended by this. And, you know, back in the day when they started, it was, you know, the hot new thing for Ivy League universities and even just Harvard at the start. And then, you know, top universities in the US, eventually it started growing outside other universities in the world, you know, and, and, and that was great. You know, it had a big success in that sense with, with that audience they've been sort of growing outside of that audience and it eventually opened up to everybody. But now, you know, I still have my Facebook account. I use it for for a couple of things that I, that I have, but the people that I actually get to find there, and, and it's been the experience of many people I, I, I talk to as well, is, you know, you go into Facebook and you meet, I'm 38 years old, and you, you get to meet with your the people that are the age of your mom, your dad, you know, sort of the grandparents of nowadays. Mm-hmm. It's a completely radically different audience. And it's not that the, the university students aged uh, till then. It's only been, what, 15, 20 years? Mm-hmm. It's just shifted audiences. And and the people who are that age nowadays are in completely different platforms. I, I don't know if, if, if keeping with that audience would have left them still managing to captivate them for so long, but, you know, they, they changed and, and it's still not for everybody. I 100% agree. The The only reason I use Facebook now is because it's connected to my Instagram. So when I post stuff on Instagram, it goes to Facebook and I will get my <laughs> my aunts and uncles uh, commenting on the Facebook and not the Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That definitely, definitely happens. So Matt, you know, decades and even generations of experience here are asked uh, this question in a way. So when you're creating, when you're, you're going through one of your creations, you're inventing something. I'm guessing that at this point you have some form of a process. Of course, it's not exactly the same every time, but if you were to invent something today in the toy industry, in the game industry, how would you approach it? What are maybe the steps, you know, or the mindset? How, how do you do it? Well, inventing and product development aren't part and parcel. So that I do, I do treat them differently. Inventing sure. literally can happen at three o'clock in the morning when I wake up to go pee, right? It can be just a, <laughs> a, a random thought that just I'll email myself and I'll make sure I have a bit of notes or I'll record something and send it to myself. And the next day I'll try to figure out if it really is viable and then take it from there. Usually it starts with a really good seed of an idea, whether that idea is a marketing idea, like in Pupcakes, it was the name that I got first. I was like, Pupcakes sounds cute, right? But like a color smash on the, on the other hand was uh, really just came to me fully realized there was no really development. I was like, this needs to do this and it needs to do that. And I'm going to make a prototype. I made a prototype in, in, in a few minutes. And, and that was that or a hashtag at which I re- referenced before I had a meeting with Hasbro. I woke up in the morning and was like, oh, this would be really cool. If you could match hashtags to random photos to get a laugh. I showered as fast as I could, jumped in my car, drove to the office, made a prototype within like 45 minutes just in time so I can get to the meeting with Hasbro and pitch it to them. Like all within a couple of, all, you know, all born and pitched all within a few hours. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. It's, I mean, not to sound all philosophical, but it is, it's a way of life. I don't really turn off, you know, when ideas come, they come. But when it comes to development, that's somebody says to me, you know, we need you to work on this. We need you to work on that. And then we have to just approach it from a very different angle. And I've been attached to some very large products over the years that have, you know, iconic, you know, and been been happy to have been part of that. But it, it's problem solving, but on a, on a, in a different respect. So it's, you know, it's design, it's engineering, it's not conceptual. So in my career, like very early in my career, worked on Tickle Me Elmo, Pogs, you know, did a ton of stuff for under Barbie licensing and, <laughs> and, and Transformers and, you know, ranging everything from ride on scooters to Monopoly games to you, you name it, you know, tons of fantastic products and been part of relaunching many classic brands. It's all strategy. It's not just creating the games. You're playing a game, making games. Huh. So it's it, it, essentially given that you're, you know, in an industry as well, it's not just you know how good the game is, but it's also the strategy around how to 
sell that game to you know initially i'm guessing that it's the big companies and the you know the the people who are licensing etc and then it's you know about getting it to sell it to being good as well to sell to people but having good marketing and all that does anything of what i'm saying make any sense to you yeah but to elaborate upon that the the big key to the success of design is that we know all the moving parts and when we develop something we're thinking of all those moving parts opposed to somebody if i just said to you i need you to come up with a game you might come back to me with a cool game um but you randomly picked how many cards are going to be in the game. You randomly decided how what the size of the box should be. Yeah. You didn't really think too hard about what part of the game aisle it's going to be at, at retail. You know, all that also has to be taken into consideration. There's a reason why there's X amount of cards in card games. It's dependent on the size of the sheet for mass production. You know, we need to yield a certain quantity. And if we go over that quantity... You know, it's going to be an additional sheet, which is going to be additional cost. If we go under that quantity, we're wasting paper, right? Um, and box sizes are dictated by planogram. A planogram is a map of the store. And if you know, if if you're if a game isn't successful, the store needs to be able to pull that game out and replace it with something else that's the same exact size. Otherwise, they have to reconfigure their whole their whole aisle. So all this needs to be taken into consideration. Wow. So much stuff, you know, that that needs to be considered for games and and especially physical games and and all that stuff that you were mentioning. I, I think it's amazing and it's it's great to have a little bit, you know, a glance into all that experience that you guys have uh, at at the company and and see again even intergenerational knowledge that has been going around at Design Edge. So thank you very much for that, Matt. And Matt, you know, when creating and well, maybe in the, the creation phase, you know, I, I know you, you mentioned that there's a, the sort of the creation where you get, you know, probably all, all the way up to a prototype and then you actually get into product development. I, I'm not I'm not sure if I'm, am, am I getting that one right? Yeah, we, we call that like the breadboard prototype, the preliminary prototype. Yes. And that's the invention part. And then, then there's a product development, right? Yeah, yeah. There's several phases of prototyping too, uh, but that would be the first phase. Amazing. Just a quick break before we continue. Are you enjoying this podcast? If you're listening through a podcasting app, please subscribe and rate us on the app. This will be of great help to reach more engagers so we can change the world together through gamification. Amazing. So within both of these, you know, both, you know, the the invention and the prototyping phase and perhaps in product development, you know, to to in experts like like most of us uh, outside of, of Design Edge, would you say that there's some form of a best practice, something that you say, well, you know, do this and at least you'll, you'll benefit from a better final product in, in some way, shape or form. The best practices vary from client to client. That's the one big takeaway I've gotten from the last, you know, few decades of doing this is, is I'll deal with one company and they've got their process and I've got that process down and I'm, you know, killing it with them. And then that's company A and then company B contacts me and they're about the same size and everything seems like it's apples to apples. And I start using a process from company A to company B and company B is like, you're doing everything wrong. You need to do this process. And then I, okay, it's not the same process at company B and then, and so on and so on and so on. Every company has its own culture, has its own processes, has its own timelines, has its own cost structure. And we've needed to learn that and work within those parameters and know what questions to ask to make sure we are hitting things. I can't make assumptions on a product needs to cost X to get to retail for them. You know, they might have different requirements. They might need to pad in things like big TV campaigns or, or make sure that they're compensating a giant movie license like Star Wars. You know, there's a lot of factors to things. And Knowing the right questions is a huge part of it, but there's no checklist of questions at the same time because every mm. project is different. It's all custom <laughs> work. So it's, it's, it's tricky to navigate within the industry on its own. So perhaps a best practice could be trying to come up with the right questions at the right time. <laughs> Something like this, right? Yeah, or, or being... Being inquisitive in, in a way, right? Inquisitive and having the personality that doesn't offend people with questions. Like knowing how to properly ask questions without offending somebody hmm. or knowing how to offend somebody properly when you need a question answered quickly and they're not and they're beating around the bush because i like to be a nice guy all the time and although i just joke don't be a d-. there are moments where i have to be a d-. it's 
I learned a long time ago, like, yeah, I work for the client, but that doesn't make the client in charge of me. And if I really just follow them blindly and, and don't raise my voice when something's going wrong, I can be the potentially the one who screwed up the entire project because I just assumed that so-and-so knew what they were doing. And sometimes that person was recently put into that role or they don't have this, they don't have the tenure really to know all the pitfalls. And it was to both of our benefit for me to chime in and tell them that they should consider X, Y, and Z. And 90% of the time they're receptive to that. And I would say 95% of the time they appreciate that. And then of course you get the, you know, that 5% who's, you know, they don't like to be told what to do. And in which case I back off, but I still told them what needed to be said. So when it doesn't work, I can go to bed at night. You did your part, right? That's the important thing always. Yeah. Yeah. And then also I, the other thing is you're going to get in any business, you're going to have clients that are abusive. And I am fortunate enough to have gotten a point in my career where I'm able to fire clients too. You know, just somebody, you know, just really just wants to bark orders and, and be the boss and, and, and not really pay attention to anything else other than you know, they want you to jump when they say jump. I'm beyond that. I'm not going to just get something done on a Friday that you don't need for three weeks because you just barked it and you just impulsively want to see something, you know. Amazing. Amazing. Hope we all get a chance to to do that uh, more often uh, as well, because <laughs> it's it's very important to be able to do that. And, you know, if you, you can also hear some people saying, well, you know, you know what, even if you're not there, it is still important to decide and say, actually, let me fire my my own client because this is not going to work. This is going to cost me more money than it's going to make me in any case. So, you know, there, there are times when I've that is appropriate. I've had clients fired that the, the next day are banging on my window, like holding a bag of bagels and donuts, begging me to, to work with them again. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's hysterical. But our reputation is pretty solid and I haven't really made any enemies, you know. But And that's part of how you build a, a reputation like that. Yeah. The, listen, I, the reason we've become such a force as a company that's the complete back end is because my clients need to know, rely on us to do the entire process or do everything or do stuff a la carte. And if I don't have a strong enough knowledge about that stuff, I'm not doing my job. So yeah, just it's just being day in and day out. And you have to have good communications with your clients. But if you know, if you've got some megalomaniac bossing you around who's just really getting a high off of, you know, telling people to jump and seeing how high they jump. It's not worth it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Matt, is there, you know, after hearing these questions, is there a reference person or a reference, uh, yeah, a reference person for sure that you would recommend and say, well, look, I would be curious at least to hear this person answering these questions, sort of a future guest on Professor Game. Uh, geez somebody within the toy and game business that I would say you'd want to speak to? Yeah, within that that, or, or maybe even somebody else that inspires you and you're, you're interested in hearing them. Whew, that is a good question. I know so many people and uh, the, I'd have to figure out who I'd want to point you to and, and make sure that they were cool with it. Uh, it depends, you know, what which area of, of business is it that you, you want to focus on? Is it the development or do you want to know more about the actual industry itself? or, or the... Usually it's it's more about the, the design phase when people are understanding what these, you know, what are, you know, called the mechanics or, or the things that are they're going on within these products to understand how to make them better. Sure. And then, of course, there's usually a lot of things that we might not be considering as much as, as you were saying, but it's usually we tend to have a little bit more focus on, on that design stage. Well, you know, what actually what I'd recommend is, so I was mentioning before the United Adventures Association of America, we created the Toy Hub, which is specific to for toy inventing. So if you go to the uiausa.org, and you go to the hubs page, you'll find the toy hub. And there we have resource videos where which we interview people and discuss with them the processes that they are involved with within the toy industry. And if there's anybody on there as we post, we just started it about a month and a half ago. We're posting new videos every other week. It's on YouTube as well. I can certainly point you to anybody that's on there because I'm in charge of all that. So <laughs> there are lots of good people. And, and interesting and, and successful people on that site. Sounds amazing. Sounds amazing. Thank you for that reference, Matt. And in that same sense, you know, is there a book perhaps that you would say, well, you know, this book might help people get inspired or, or understand things a little bit better? Inventing? Yeah, there's a, there's a book on inventing, an Inventor Confidential by Warren Tuttle. Inventor Confidential. Sounds very, yeah, very Warren. interesting for sure. I'm going to put that on my list. 
<laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good book. And Warren is uh, was the former president of the United Inventors Association, and he was and he still is uh, running the Inventor Relations Program for a Lifetime Brands, which is one of the leading housewares item to companies in the world. Amazing. And within this industry, the toys and games industry, what would you say Matt Nuccio's superpower is? That thing that you do at least better than most people. Oh, drink beer. <laughs> Other than that, I think it's a good broad sense of the entire industry and not being hyper-focused or centric to the needs of one particular part. Realizing that Marketing has to align with design, which has to align with manufacturing, which has to align with distribution. Amazing. Amazing. And we come to a difficult question now, Matt. As a creator and inventor of many games and toys, what would you say, and it can be one of yours or not, it's up to you, because there's, there's many there and it's going to still be difficult. What is your favorite game? My favorite game? Let's see. Uh, I play Risk a lot with my kids and Settlers of Catan. <laughs> I like those a lot. Sounds good. <laughs> good ones to answer for sure. Risk used to be um, an obsession of mine quite a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say it was before meeting Settlers of Catan and this new sort of new wave or generation of, of board games, but it, it was definitely a big reference for me for many, many years. Well, they're both landmark games within their categories, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And Matt, you know, is there any anything else you want to say before we end the interview? Any final piece of advice, whatever you want to go for? Of course, let us know where we can find out more about you and your work, and then we'll say it's game over. Sure. Well, I mean, parting advice really is: if you want to invent, you need to be open-minded, and you need to understand feedback and be able to take feedback, and don't be stubborn. Now, you might not agree with somebody, but that's okay. You know, and if they just just roll with it because you, you'll learn things. And if, if you're inventing a game, you really want to just have play test the heck out of it. And if people screw up the game when they're playing it, maybe you want to pay attention to why they're messing it up and either fix your directions hmm. or you might learn something and learn a golden moment and actually incorporate those mistakes into the game to make a better gameplay. That's for where to find me. You can go to designedge.net or you can go to my LinkedIn page. A lot of people like to contact me through LinkedIn. So it's Matt, M-A-T-T, Nuccio, N-U-C-C-I-O. You'll find me. I'm the only Matt Nuccio who's doing toys and games and LinkedIn, so not too hard to find. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Thank you again, Matt, for all these insights, all this knowledge, all the understanding that you have brought to the podcast today, especially within the toys and games industry. However, engagers, however, Matt, as you know at this point, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Hey, Engagers, and thank you for listening to the Professor Game Podcast. And if you want to continue having amazing interviews with guests like Matt, please go ahead to professorgame.com slash subscribe and get started on our email list for free. We'll be in contact. We'll send you good stuff your way, and you'll be the first to know of any opportunities that we might have for you. And of course, before you go on to your next mission, as we'd like to remind you, please go ahead and subscribe or follow. This is also for free using your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there. Mm -hmm.